Anyway, I'm Benny Cornelius, I work at Zebia, and in the next 30 or so minutes, uh, I'm going to tell you a, bit, a little bit about how we built hot swappable infrastructure uh, using CoreOS. We added a for humans part because we try to strip out as many of the difficult stuff uh, as possible. Let's start with, with this. Hello World is not production ready. Uh, what I mean by this um, is that, well, I go to quite a few conferences and meet up here and there. Uh, try up a, try, try a, a lot of new stuff. Uh, and usually, uh, readme.md doesn't get me where I want to be. It, if it works at all, it's certainly not production ready. Um, even worse, sometimes even documentation doesn't get you where you should be in production. Um, let's pick a relevant example, ETCD. I'm sorry for uh, the guys in here who work on it. Uh, if, I, if I look at the documentation of RedCD, yeah, um, well, let's suggest I should use the discovery service for bootstrapping my cluster. Yeah. Uh, I can use the, the discovery service or an SRV DNS record then. Both work pretty well, uh, except when one of my nodes dies, because then I have to do some manual stuff. That's also in the manual, and it's not very hard. But I need to do some manual stuff to rebootstrap my cluster. And seriously, who wants to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning to rebootstrap a cluster because a node failed when you really shouldn't have to? So then there's the other thing. Um, you, cannot, you, you can't ever be down. And the reason I added this slide is not because people in here don't know they, that you cannot be down. Well. There is something with container technology and companies I've been for the past year. Uh, what I've seen m multiple times actually is that a small team is formated and that team is tasked with, okay, let's test out container technology. You guys do what you want to do, build a small platform. It's a proof of concept. Take your time, figure out if it works. And they do. And after two or three months, they have a platform and it works, and it's cool, it has some service discovery, it can run containers, it has some, some automated deployment and some unimportant apps running on it. And then, well, I don't know exactly how it happens, but usually some really mission critical service ends up on the platform and suddenly you are running a production infrastructure. That's not really handy. You are like a two-man team you're running a production infrastructure and you bootstrap your ECD or whatever using the easy bootstrap method. So if something dies, you're down. Or you need to wake up and fix it. Or worse, things didn't die, but you want to do an upgrade or do some changes. And either you're not good at getting a maintenance window at all, uh, or you're getting your maintenance window at Saturday night, 11 p.m., <laughs> things like that. Nobody wants that. This sounds l a lot better, I think. Just do your maintenance or whatever you need to do during office hours, cup of coffee, nobody will notice. Nobody will actually care because it'll work. So how do you do that? You build a hot swappable infrastructure using CoreOS. We have basically four things I, that, that I would like to discuss that you really need, need to figure out to make this work. And the first is you, you need to maintain your entire infrastructure as code. Uh, let's do a little show of hands. In this room, who is using infrastructure as code in one way or another? Who is using infrastructure as code to actually deploy servers? Not bad. Who is using, who's still doing everything by hand? Okay. Uh, the other question is who's who, who, <coughs> who lied? No, no, no. no, no. The other is, who is confident that he destroys his current whatever environment that he will be able to restore it from his code? Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. So, what we do is we use Terraform to to define our entire infrastructure, and what that gives us is hey, everything is code. So that's cool. Um, we can deploy multiple instances of the same platform, which is great if you want to actually test out your new setup uh, without interfering with the running cluster. You build, just build a new one. Just 
completely isolated next to it, it behaves exactly the same. It's the same code. It works in the same way. Perhaps some URLs will change, but it's similar. Second part is you use Flee to define your application deployments. Imagine you have a whole bunch of chorus nodes. Simply define what you need to run where. Perhaps you need, well, I need a, a worker that, that runs Docker. Um, I need a CPU opti optimized node. I need a, a node in a, spe a specific data center, SS SSD storage, etc., etc. Second one is design your platform for failure, and this may sound obvious as well, but from what, from what I've seen, a lot of people design their platform to prevent failure. Not a lot of people design their platform to actually handle failure. It's usually a case of, okay, if some component will fail, we will make two of them. And if, if it actually fails, it beeps, and someone has to go out and fix it. That's 50% of the solution. It's much better if, you, if it doesn't beep, it just fixes itself. Because everything will fail. Uh, one of the things we use for that is autoscaling groups. Everything in our environment that's a server of some sort is in an autoscaling group. If we go back a few slides to this picture, then the central services will also be an autoscaling group. Not because I want to scale my amount of, of master nodes from 3 to 5 to 9 or whatever, but simply because if one fails, I want a new one immediately without me having to do anything. <coughs> so, auto-scaling groups. Then we have our components. We have console running on it, we have a proxy, perhaps some monitoring agent, some logging agent, uh, and the applications them, themselves, obviously. Uh, it's really important to make those components work independently of each other, even though they might need each other, even though you, 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 you might have, an, have a proxy that relies on console for configuration, they should be able to fail independently of each other, and also they should be able to boot independently of each other. So if the Nginx container starts, there's no console yet, it'll wait until console is there and then it'll work. Speaking of containers, this one was obvious. Uh, use Docker to isolate platform and application. Uh, actually, I don't really need to reiterate because you've already <laughs> explained it in the previous presentation. Uh, the less your platform knows about the application, the better it is. The easier it is to move your, ap to move your ap application around, to run it everywhere. And the easier it is for your application to run everywhere. Remove all state from your platform. Oh. It's easy, right? Except from your mm. storage, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew this, this one was coming. <laughs> so, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we use an external Docker registry, and the first one we tried was Docker Hub, which proved pretty slow, so we're not doing that anymore. What we do, what we're doing now is we, we use a local registry. We don't store the containers internally. We use S3 for that. So that way you have your local registry. It does work, but you don't store your actual artifacts on your platform. You can destroy the entire platform, still have all the images. For application data, pretty much the same. Externalize it. Make sure that the data is stored outside of your platform, which can be a block storage service. It can be, if, you, if you're running on-premise, for instance, it can be an, an NFS or a nice cozy share. But in this case, we're running on, 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 cloud, on a cloud platform. We might use S3. S3. The fourth point is dynamic service discovery and routing. Pretty much if your application can run everywhere, well, applications should be able to find each other or find the components they need, uh, need to dynamically reconfigure if you, if you scale. For instance, I think most of you will, will get this, but who of you uh, need more than one change to add an application to the platform? 
Just one hand. Oh, I see a few more hands. Because you, depending on your infrastructure, you might need a change to actually deploy the application. You might need a change to your firewall. You need a change to your load balancer. You need whatever. If you have dynamic service discovery and routing, in the case of the platform that I recently built, all I actually need is, ch is change one line of code to deploy the application, and the rest is managed. Console takes care of that. There it is. Uh, we use console as our service uh, discovery uh, mechanism, yeah, as our key value store. Uh, we use it in, com in combination with the registrator, so every Docker container that we launch is automatically registered with, with console. Uh, key value store, uh, key value pairs that we store in the Docker file are automatically registered with, with console. We use those on a proxy. Uh, for instance, to configure whether or not we want some redirect to happen or whether we want HTTPS or not, things like that. basically gave this one away. Uh, our entire Nginx config uh, is based off a template that's like 20 lines. And on a day-to-day -day basis, our Nginx config is about, I think, 400 lines of automatically generated code. Whenever a container starts or stops, configuration is updated. Uh, by the way, we don't use a console agent for that. There's no console agent in our container. We use console template for that. And there are some upsides and downsides to that, by the way. Um, console, age, uh, console template, what it basically does is create a console, up, ge generate a config file from whatever template you, you specified, and run whatever command you specified. And it, in our case, we reload Nginx. Um, it's great, it works, it's lightweight. The bad thing is that if you don't configure it well, it puts a lot of load on console. So be aware of that. If you're watching 200 applications from five proxies, you're, you might get some warnings in your console logs that you're probably DDoSing your, your console cluster. And will you have two processes in your Docker container? Um, yes, you have. Um, what we uh, do in our Nginx container, we have a small shell script as our entry point that basically loops console template and whenever a console template runs, it executes another script that reloads Nginx. Is that something that you could do elegantly by combining two containers? Mm. Maybe that one container has to restart the other, maybe that's tricky. Some best practice here. I'm not sure if you if you would need to. I think I don't. Uh, it's complicated, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I think more, it's like the pods. Like, uh, as Google said, we found actually that in reality. Uh, you often have one or more containers you're forming on uh, functionality. And in this case, the HTTP router just needs sort of this, this goes together, right? Yeah. The, the generating of the config file and the running the HTTP proxy are, are one. Okay. So if, if it's not a sacred rule, maybe in a potted group. Yeah. In a potted group. Yeah. 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 But it's not a sacred rule to run just one process in a container. For anyone doubting that, try and run postfix. <laughs> <laughs> in more in more than one container without actually duplicating stuff. Well, the, the nice thing about this is, of course, that um, you get to use the stuff you already know, like uh, uh, Nginx or HAProxy, whatever you like, and, and you get to uh, integrate you know, the, the dynamic service discovery stuff yeah. uh, quite easily. You don't have to completely replace whatever front-end proxy or web server you're, you're used to. I also used it with this with Apache when we just started out, when we, when we were just figuring out okay, which one are we going to use. Are we going to use HA proxy? Are we going to use Nginx, VulcanD, whatever? Uh, we also tried Apache and it, it worked. It wasn't as elegant as Nginx was, hence we chose it. But it works. You can basically generate every kind of configuration that you that you would possibly want. So, that's what we don't want. Waking up 3 a.m., fixing stuff, or staying up till 3 a.m. to finally being allowed to do stuff. That's what we'd like. Just apply changes, 
within office hours, yeah. with nobody noticing. Uh, and you can do that. And in fact, um, recently at one of our one of our projects, we actually did that without announcing it. We had our bi-weekly end of sprint demo where all the product teams uh, show off their, their, their new creations. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the most important moment of sprint. All the stakeholders are there, things cannot fail. So what we did was we replaced the entire platform during the, the sprint demo without announcing it, without anyone noticing, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and the day after, we, we, uh, we, we posted on our Slack uh, general channel, like, guys, we had a sprint demo yesterday. We demoed our platform, and nobody was there. Nobody noticed. And people started, well, apologizing, and sorry, we, we were busy. We wanted to see your demo. And we were like, we were glad nobody noticed. Invisible infrastructure. We uh, we absolutely absolutely replaced every single server during that session. And it took like twenty minutes to replace the entire infrastructure. Notice you don't you don't use uh, Kubernetes? Uh, not yet. We actually chose Fleet as our scheduler. Uh, first of all, it comes free. So if you're if, if you choose to to, to use Corvus, you get Fleet for free. So why not use it? Um, it pretty much does everything we need at this point, but we do feel that we might run into some limitations along the way. Um, and also, we are planning on, on, on uh, working together with the, the, the already sitting Linux uh, management team who is ma managing the legacy infrastructure. And they are used to Red Hat Linux. Uh, they are now migrating to, to Red Hat Linux uh, 7. So they are starting to use system D. And I think, well, the horror is slightly <laughs> limited. If we show them a fleet unit file, and they might be like, hey, this looks like system D. Instead of, Thank hey, you. here's something totally new. Uh, and there's also containers that are new, and Terraform, that's new. And here's more complexity <laughs> that's also new. So it's, it's, it's also a matter of keeping things as uncomplicated as we can. So, that's what, what we would like to do. That well in time. And well that was pretty time. quick. Yeah. <laughs> you have any questions? Any questions? What's the... During this demo, we replaced this, this uh, 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 host or container. How many containers were replaced? Uh, we replaced a total of, I think, uh, 20 servers. And I think, not sure how many containers were, were running at that point, but... Around the Yeah. And where went most of the time? Uh, most of the time uh, went into waiting. <laughs> because if, if you replace an instance, it takes some time to rebootstrap. Uh, start. Yeah, to start it all. Um, so it's it's mostly waiting. And everything was gracefully <laughs> filled over. Yeah. yeah. The only thing uh, we can't actually take away is the network. But everything else, yeah. Hmm. And how 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 low it was this for the user? divide our, our, our course worker nodes into several groups for dev, test, production, etc. Our dev group was pretty loaded. So to handle that, we skilled it up first. Uh, and the other ones, they were at production capacity. So we always have some, sp some, some spare room to, to, to fail. Well, also to do this swapping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because but basically that's... Uh, that's the fun part. I mean, whether you want to, to implement this to gracefully fill or to have maintenance during office hours, you get the other one for free. So, thank you for the talk. I, I like it a lot. Um, I am uh, sort of uh, astonished that you're uh, using Fleet and uh, make this all together. 
I understand you're doing so you're early, right? So it's all fine here. But what should be our taking home point? Should it be either like uh, loop Kubernetes going the right way? It's awesome. Go that way, or well, in 20 minutes you can build your own stack. So <laughs> yeah, don't don't bother. Right? Neither. So, can you give me I, some, some advice on your your lessons learned in the process of? Uh, gathering yeah, all yeah, these tools yeah. and, and doing this yourself. Yeah, I think uh, from the two options you just offered me, ni neither. I don't want to, to give you a stack that you can build in 20 minutes um, because a lot of people are doing that and then usually you run into the production problems because it was uh, aimed at instant grat gratification. Mm -hmm. Get clone one command and enjoy. Yeah. And, and when you're done, you destroy it. Mm -hmm. Except that you're pretty much never done with production. Uh, the other one, uh, I haven't done a lot with Kubernetes. I think it's a great product from what I've seen so far. And I, I don't want to try to sell you on a single product. I think uh, what I want you to take away from it, fr fr from this is uh, production has its own challenges. And usually the easy way of setting things up uh, is not the way you should run it in production. Mm -hmm. And what you should be doing is well, keeping in mind early on in the process that this might become production. Because what I've seen at multiple companies is a proof of concept turning into production overnight. Simply by the first really important app migrating onto it and suddenly you are running production. And if you well, decided to take some shortcuts because well, it's easy to prove concept, then you're going to, you're going to suffer later. Anyone? Have you considered using Juju to uh, deploy Kubernetes or any other of these tooling? No, actually Juju? not. Yeah. It's a, it's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you, can upgrade, you can upgrade your infrastructure after you deploy it with Juju to the next version of Kubernetes or whatever you, you deploy with it. So. Interesting. Yeah. We should have a chat afterwards. <laughs> In the back. Yeah. <laughs> How do you perform active monitoring, especially from the perspective of the discovery of new innovations and uh, pieces? Uh, we currently, uh, for, for, for monitoring, we use two uh, uh, ways to monitor st our, our infrastructure. We use SysDig from, from one aspect, and we use console health checks. And we combine those to, to verify either on a platform or, or an application level if something's healthy. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, <coughs> capacity monitoring. Uh, capacity monitoring. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Uh, that the one we do using SysDig, using pretty rudimentary met metrics at, at this point. Um, next step would be to to uh, implement some capacity monitoring so we can auto-scale our workers, for instance. Yes. You remove, when you remove state from containers, what kind of problem do you have? Uh, what kind of problems do we, do we have? Well, uh, a lot of the new applications that our specific client was uh, developing were stateless, so we, uh, we we didn't have a lot of problems in that in that respect. Uh, we did have a few stateful applications, um, and mostly uh, the state is in, is in a database, and we used that uh, we used Amazon's RDS for that, and using the snapshotting of on your RDS instance, you basically take away uh, state from that. And we actually used the snapshotting of those databases to create a new instance of the platform and run an application there with a copy of the database. And all the, all the session states of the client was, uh, was moved to the client as well. Yeah. So, they, um, so you uh, got the, the, the actual data off outside of the platform and the client state, session state on the client. How do you go about uh, configuration Versioning of configuration management. 
uh, can you elaborate what you exactly mean? Well, for example, in within a uh, uh, console, if you give you a configuration there, uh, how do you go about the, the, the version of those configuration? If you have multiple versions of your, uh, of your environments, and you want to move between them? Uh, currently, we have uh, namespaced our dev test plot stages. Uh, and we can also namespace the applications themselves, so they each instance of an application can have their own configuration metadata. Can you actually do that also? Yeah. And can you estimate how large what the amount of versions? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, don't really have an answer there. Well, a feeling rather than an answer. No. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to... to yeah. In the back? Yeah. Do you aggregate loads somehow? Um, what we currently have, it's it's not a finished platform, it's, it's some, some central log ag aggregation uh, that we're currently not sending anywhere, except for FRS3. But we need to implement something better for that, so... Yeah. Yeah. Again? <laughs> I have this question because of another question. Uh, when you deliver a lot of, let's say, releases per day, in the final, you might have, let's say, for one week, some production bug, which causes quite... Yeah, which has some quite significant impact. And uh, some of the engineers will be investigating what happened. Because of me, which uh, in non-mature projects is not controllable, you are performing releases and you don't indeed on track who is releasing what. Different teams are releasing different parts of application. And uh, because of that, this bug might have uh, legacy reasons. Just because of coincidence, two of sub-applications were not connect connected in a good way. And because of that, this problem appeared. How do you track those things when you have tons of containers? Uh, currently, that's absolutely hard to track. Uh, currently, what we do um, is try to, to uh, have a, uh, start with good communication between your teams. So you can pretty much... Um, um, Get to a, si a, si a situation where teams are not just releasing their own mm -hmm. stuff. They are part of, uh, in, in this case, they are part of, part, part of a larger product. They are not feature teams, but the, Im the independent products aren't, as you state, completely independent. They, they, they rely on each other. Um, so, what, so what we do is we, we have those teams sit together twice a week, uh, test together at some occasions, but from a logging per perspective, we don't have anything yet. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much.